We welcome you to Bay State Health's Ready for School COVID-19 in Your Child, presented by Bay State Health Every Woman and Women Empowered. At this event, all attendees will be muted. You can type in your questions in the Q&A box, and you can use the chat box if you need assist assistance from the host. Due to scheduling conflicts, we have a change for one of our presenters, and we'd like to introduce two Bay State Health experts, <coughs> Dr. John O'Reilly, Chief of General Pediatrics, and Dr. Esteban Del, Pil Del Pilar Morales, Bay State Infectious Disease. Welcome everyone, and thank you for attending. So I'm gonna just go through a few PowerPoint slides to sort of set up the conversation. Uh, basically that I have uh, many days uh, at in the clinic, and I think that people across the area and across the country are having. So this issue of back to school and are we ready for it is really a, a complex risk benefit discussion. And in some ways it really brings me back to my days doing medical ethics. And I think it's a discussion between parents, caregivers, family members, housemates. There's uh, the education team input for their student, the pediatrician or the healthcare provider taking care of that student. And if there's a mental health provider or therapist that's already working with the student or family about issues, all of those folks should be involved in this complicated discussion. And let me go into a little more detail. Then let's start with why, why do kids go to school? What's important? What's the benefit in this risk benefit discussion? Well, I think every parent who had their child home in the spring would be really thankful for a professional educator helping with their child learning stuff. And many parents are just done with helping their kid with math homework that they don't understand. But besides the, you know, the basic reading and writing and arithmetic academics of school, really there's an important non-academic developmental learning that happens. Kids are learning these social emotional skills. The youngest kids in kindergarten, first grade, preschool are really learning social cues. They're learning to read people. They're learning to engage in conversations and to you know, play well with others and to share their to toys and all the things on that list about everything I needed to know in life I learned in kindergarten. So there's a lot going on and it really doesn't end there. I mean, the adolescents are learning how to become an independent self away from home. And students on all levels are learning from their peers and learning by dealing with non-parent adults. How do I interact with adults in society? How do I work with my peers? Now, there are also students that get non-academic services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, that are really critical for those students' success long-term as adults. There are students that receive academic services, kids that have learning disabilities, say dyslexia and others, kids for which English is not their primary language, and it's important to have that immersion and to work with educators that are working with students with uh, other languages as a primary language. There are a lot of mental health services that happen in school. The counseling system of today is a lot different than it was 50, 60 years ago. And a lot of students uh, will get their mental health weekly visits in school because a lot of community mental health agencies are really partnering with schools and embedding therapists and other counselors in schools. Schools also, for many children, the safe place. They're not worried about domestic violence. They're not worried about food insecurity. They're not worthy, worry about how cold it's gonna be where they're going to be. And they see school as a safe place. There's also a lot of medical services that happen in schools. Kids are getting medications, they're getting treatments. The nurse is checking them for their vision, their hearing, their scoliosis. 
So many medical things happen in school that benefit kids. For many of my kids, that's where they get their best nutrition, that they get two or three meals a day in school. And it's a place where they can exercise safely because some kids in our area don't have safe outdoor places to exercise. So nutrition, exercise, something that they might not get as well at home. And as we think about this list, one thing to remember is that all children do not experience this risk and benefit equally. Some kids get more benefit out of schools than others. Some kids have more needs that are met at school than others. So equity is maybe more important than equality. And clearly one size does not fit all in these decisions. So what's the risk side of this? Well, there's risk about COVID-19. That's why we're here on this webinar. What's the risk to their individual child? And what's the risk that that child will bring COVID home and potentially affect or infect their grandparent who might have chronic medical conditions such as hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and so on. There are mental health issues really on both sides of this. We're seeing really among kids of all ages, a lot more signs of mental health issues with stress, anxiety. Sometimes it's worse when they're home. Sometimes it's worse when they're in school. And that, again, is a conversation to have. And although we talked a lot about the social benefit of school with kids that are learning their interactions and so on, there's also a social risk for some kids at school. We do a fair, see a fair amount of bullying for a, a gamut of reasons. And I think that um, that is something that, that we have to take into consideration. And it's been fascinating me, to me as a provider doing some telehealth check-ins with patients where their anxiety level has gone down because they're no longer getting picked on at school. They're no longer getting bullied. And that is, again, for a number of reasons um, that kids bully other kids and kids are mean. So let's start with the parents. I look on parents as their expert on their own child and on their family system. So they know best the physical health of their child and how their child is reacting to different potential illnesses. They know about their mental health of their child. How is their kid doing at home right now? How are they doing in school? And then the academics. How was your child before school got shut down back in the spring? What were their educational programs? How were they doing with it? And then what happened to their child's academic program when they went virtual? Is this a child that continued to thrive and do the work and keep up with things? Or is this a child that really did not advance and perhaps some kids regressed over this time in terms of academics and performance? And I think the other thing that parents know really well is what are the medical conditions of the other people that make up the community around that child? We talked about the grandparent with uh, chronic medical illnesses. Perhaps there are people that are on biologics like Humira and others. Perhaps there's other immune deficiencies at home. And that's something that the parents know best and need to bring that to part of the conversation of decision making. Pediatricians, we know a lot about the physical health of our patients what medications they're taking and what might impact them. We also are learning and continuing to learn about the COVID risk and applying that risk to that individual patient. We know a lot about the mental health state of children and how COVID's impacting it and how potentially that child may um, react to going back to school. There are also, and I just put two up here, some good websites that um, we use for parents when we're having these discussions. One is the AAP website, the healthychildren.org that has a lot about COVID-19 and a lot about going back to school. 
And the Child Mind Organization has a lot about children's mental health before and after COVID. So both are good resources that I use when I give information to parents and that, that participants might want to look at. The educator team really knows about what your, the child needs for their educational success. Do they have an IEP, 504? Do they have some language stuff? What alternative services are they getting? How did that child do before COVID? How did that child do a quarantine? It has been shocking in many places where educators will talk about a third of students not even connecting to the school, that the educators are worried about those high-risk kids that for many reasons may not be connecting to schools. So getting the education team is involved is important. And whether that child goes to school or whether that child stays home and does it virtual, the real question that they need to help answer is how do we best meet that individual child's education needs and goals in whichever setting they're going to be? There's a big public health component to this, and you can't pick up a newspaper or read the New York Times without seeing many of these stories. And I think parents should be going to sites that, that are giving them good information. The Mass Department of Public Health is one of those. Uh, in terms of school itself, a, a great uh, resource is the Harvard School of Public Health. I put two of these resources. One was all about how do we get a school safe for going back, you know, for kids coming back safely. And it has a lot of information that parents might want to read and then discuss with their school and with their principal and see what their school is doing about these things. They, they did this uh, article about 20 questions parents should ask. And I think every parent in, that I see here and that every participant should look over these 20 questions and see how they might get answered in their child's particular case. And I think above all, uh, despite uh, all the political things that are happening to it, uh, I still believe the CDC is a, a reputable site at this point. And I think that we all need to realize that safely going back to school depends on community spread of COVID being low. If the COVID level in the community gets over 5%, it really is not prudent to bring kids to school. So if you want your kids to go to school, parents should be modeling all the activities of mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing, and so on, that will help keep the community safe. And I think we have two experiences in terms of public health questions. They, can we actually do this? And there are two really good studies, one in Australia and recently in the MMWR from Rhode Island, saying that especially these preschool and younger kids, if we take care, all the precautions around COVID, we can have these students go back to their preschools and kindergartens and early grades without a rapid rise in uh, COVID-19 cases. On the other hand, I think anybody watching the news may have heard about the Georgia camp where they didn't require mask wearing, they didn't have windows open, they had no circulation, and probably two thirds or more of kids in the camp uh, wound up with COVID because kids can spread COVID to each other if we don't take precautions. I think the other thing coming out of Georgia is the picture of that high school crowded, you know, it looked like a rugby, rugby scrum going down the hallway at, at the beginning of their school year. And within weeks, you know, dozens and dozens of those kids had COVID. So we can learn from other mistakes. But the bottom line here is that it, we really need to put the effort in. We need to put the safeguards in if we're going to keep our kids safe in school. And if they're going back, besides their usual books and pencils and everything that a parent always brings, 
pack that extra COVID backup bag. Mask gets dirty, mask gets wet. The kids are going to need some more. Put in that hand sanitizer and practice it with the kids. So kids should be wearing their masks. Practice at hand washing. Practice at social distancing. And sort of be aware that they shouldn't be, you know, joining those big gaggle of kids that are going to come. They're going to say, nope, I don't want to go near that gang there. Let me step over here. And pediatricians are used to the pre-going back to school conversation with parents about getting your child into a healthy sleep cycle. No more video games till two in the morning. Get into a daily routine. And in that routine, healthy eating, exercise, self-care, the same way we try to deal with self-care for our stress around COVID, kids should be doing it. And obviously, play is the biggest way that kids do a little bit of self-care and de-stressing. But art, music, dance, and even young kids can do meditation, mindfulness, gratitude practices, all things that have been shown to really help kids' mental health. And even if they go to school, you're still going to have to plan where's homework coming in. If your kid is staying home and doing virtual school, they really have to do most of the same things. They have to be proficient at mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, because it makes no sense to keep them home, to keep them safe, and then let them go outside and play with 25 kids on, around the corner. Get your kids into a healthy sleep cycle. Yes, they may only have two hours of school, but they still shouldn't be up to 2 a.m. doing video games. Get that. Kids like to know what their routine is. It decreases anxiety and stress levels. If they know they're going to wake up at 9, and then they're going to do this, and at 10, they're going to do their school, and at 12, they're going to do this, create those routines for kids including all those healthy self-care things. And, you know, for some kids, that might include some time that they're doing video games. Even if you don't like them doing video games, give them some de-stress time. And as well, plan homework, schoolwork into that routine. And I put reading in both of those as well. I can't overemphasize that we should have kids doing less screens and more books. They need that imaginative time that books bring them. They need that focus and quiet downtime for their limbic system. So reading is important. And really, in the end, there's no one right answer. Every child is unique. Every family situation is unique. From the medical point of view, scientists are going to bring us facts and anybody that follows the news says, oh, well, last week they said this, and this week they said this. Um, you know, in my lifetime, if I had a dollar every time eggs were healthy and eggs are not healthy, I would have retired a long time ago. But this idea of what's happening with COVID, we're still learning. So be aware that the facts will change and be aware that when they do, we have to rethink this risk-benefit calculation that we're making. So also things change as your student either stays home or goes back to school. See how they're adjusting to the school day. Is it more anxiety or less anxiety? Are there more issues coming up? And if they're home, how are things working out? Are they able to do the schoolwork without having a teacher there? You might have to adjust about that as well. And the reality is there may not be one final decision. I think we all have to be flexible. The fact that we can send kids back on October 1st doesn't mean that kids will be in school on November 1st because of implications around what's happening in the community. So parents shouldn't beat on themselves too much. They don't have all the information. They are making their best judgment based on their family value system. And we need to know that there's flexibility built into the system. So that's my overlook into um, kids going back. And I will leave it to other panelists and the questions.
Okay, we do have some questions in the Q&A. One is, uh, my son is four years old and was diagnosed with Guillain-Barré syndrome seven months ago, right before the pandemic. Would he still be considered immune compromised and at high risk? Well, Guillain-Barré syndrome is an interesting um, disorder. And I think the the most or the biggest implication for him will actually be about flu vaccine. Uh, one in two million people that get the flu vaccine, one to two out of a million people that get of the flu vaccine get Guillain-Barre. And, and I would be a little hesitant to give him a uh, flu vaccine. But in terms of his immune system itself, uh, generally, if he's in a recovery phase, no, I don't think that would be an issue. I, I would defer. We have an infectious disease expert here, but I think the neuro, it is more a neurologic issue. And as long as the autoimmune piece is over with, besides the flu vaccine, I think uh, I would not consider him immunocompromised. Let's ask our expert. Uh, I agree with Dr. O'Reilly. You know, uh, usually when you're talking about Guillain-Barre, it's an overreaction of the immune system rather than uh, an underperformance. So as long as the patient is outside that window from when they're giving them high dose steroids or all of these medications that can suppress the immune system, uh, the child should be okay. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, I, I agree with Dr. O'Reilly that my biggest concern will be more around flu vaccination. Uh, so that's something that might be discussed at that time with the pediatrician, but I will be a little bit uh, hesitant to just uh, say uh, blankly, oh, yeah, I give it or not give it. I think it's a conversation that needs to happen with, with the parents. So I wouldn't necessarily consider the patient uh, in the immunocompromised group. Yeah. And I hey guess guys, this, hey the other thing I would say. Just have another pediatrician chime in. And I think if they don't get the flu shot, then they're going to need a letter, right? You'll need to ask your pediatrician because there's the mandate now to have flu shots if you're uh, before the end of the year in Massachusetts schools. And, and the other part of that conversation with the pediatrician will be you, the pediatrician should probably have a low threshold for using Tamiflu in somebody that might have flu-like symptoms where they, they would be a little less reluctant. So I think in that situation, I certainly would talk to your child's pediatrician and, and, and go through all these issues we brought up. Thanks. Uh, we have another question. If all kids stayed home for, you might have touched on this, if all kids stayed home for a year, how damaging would it really be? It seems like avoiding all the stress and eliminating risk would be healthier than what's happening now. Well, I, again, I think part of what I was trying to get to there was that some kids benefit from school more than others. So there may be kids in that are, you know, on AP students in a suburb that have amazing internet connection and, you know, they're on autopilot and they probably don't even need their teacher anyway. Those kids yeah, they're going to be able to do that fine. But a, a, a child who has significant learning disabilities, um, has significant physical needs that they require um, the physical therapist and the occupational therapist so that they can write or use a stander, or if there's language things where their parents at home are not primary English speakers and may not be able to do the English education that the school can, I, 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 so I don't think there's a blanket answer. I think each child, uh, we have to look at them individually and say, boy, this kid really needs these services. And, you know, maybe there's an alternative set, a setting to, to schools, but I, I think saying no kid goes to school, I think harms many kids, especially the kids that are already at a disadvantage socioeconomically or because of justice issues otherwise. I'll, I'll defer to my other panelists as well. Anything else to say on that? Okay, there is uh, another question. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on number of college students that should be together in a classroom and the risk of that as long as they are distant and mas masked? 
Uh, <laughs> Thomas, you go. Yeah, go ahead. Go. <laughs> you, you go so the college is a whole different uh, ballpark, right? Oh. They, most of them are testing pretty frequently. Yeah, so colleges uh, is quite different. And obviously, depending on the college that you might look at is what the circumstances are. Uh, if you look at some of the experiences that we have around here with uh, UMass and Amherst, uh, they are trying to keep to the social distancing, uh, wearing masks, and you would expect that someone that's in college that's 18 and above should be conscientious enough that we'll be able to follow these rules. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen that uh, universities and colleges that have not really followed these uh, uh, as well as others have had issues with outbreaks within their university, particularly in the South. Uh, and you got to take into account that it's not just what's going on in class because, you know, the professor himself or themselves uh, can control what's happening inside the classroom really well because either you follow the rules or they kick you out. Uh, but once that student is outside the classroom and you start integrating the social aspect of uh, college life, that's when things get a little bit more murky and... Uh, I can I mean, imagine that most of us remember when we were teenagers and we were willing perhaps to take a little bit more risks at that time with certain things uh, that we might be uh, doing now. So I think that it's this balance that needs to happen. You know, the same thing that applies for schools it would apply for colleges. You know, they should be wearing masks. They should be social distancing. They should be washing their hands consistently. Uh, and obviously they shouldn't be crowding the hallways like we've seen in pictures in the media. But again, my concern will be after the class is over and these students go to their dorms, uh, they go to uh, activities outside of the class environment. That's, I think, where the risk might be a little bit more uh, pronounced. And that's where they, the teaching of the student itself and uh, that communication with uh, their parents of, you know, these are the things that we're worried about. The same way that we talk to our kids about alcohol, drugs, sex, is the same way we need to talk to them about COVID this year. Uh, and tell them that, you know, these are the realities, these are the facts that we know at, at this point. And, you know, you are a, a young adult, and I'm hoping that you can make uh, good decisions and... <laughs> You know, that will be the, my uh, fo focus. Uh, not necessarily what happens to happen in the classroom, but more what's happening outside. I totally agree. They can be six foot away in the, the, the classroom, but they're, they're going to be belly to the bar, shoulder to shoulder, and that's the problem. And as an Irishman, I'm allowed to say that. Right. <laughs> And I'll, I'll just chime in. A lot of them have very complicated testing plans. They're testing every three days or once a week. And, you know, hopefully they're keeping track and they have, again, thresholds like we're monitoring Massachusetts for a certain percentage, you know, over 10, over 20 percent that everyone goes home. We're seeing that played out across the country. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I always tell uh, my colleagues and uh, my patients that, you know, you shouldn't uh, take a negative test as a uh, blanket letter to, oh, I'm okay, so I can go and do whatever. Because the way I explain it is that you could be infected here, you get tested here, this test is negative because it's too early, but you're still having symptoms and spreading it, and you don't develop symptoms until here, you get tested again and you're positive. So all the people that you interacted between here and here got exposed. So testing is great and I'm all for it, uh, but that shouldn't lower the guard of anyone that, oh, I still need to wear my mask. I still need to wash my hands. I need to still keep my distance from people. There is another question of student or teacher with ITP platelets ranging around 30,000 with no current treatment, are they considered high risk? Well, again, ITP is one of those interesting sort of autoimmune illnesses where the immune system atta generally attacks the platelets. And we talked about in Guillain-Barre and it was mentioned about what the treatment for that was is on, you know, steroids or other things, well, then they're at risk. I think, 
ITP of, its, of itself, and again, I will defer to my adult colleagues here for that. It can be a, a chronic Evans syndrome kind of thing, and I don't know that that puts the rest of their immune system at risk. So I'm going to defer to the, to the grown-up doctors. <laughs> so uh, when you're talking about a, uh, ITP, the big concern is uh, the treatment that you're getting, because sometimes these patients are on fairly high steroid uh, treatments, and Obviously, that could put you at an increased risk of not just COVID, but a whole bunch of other infections. Uh, it's been shown that if you have certain cardiovascular disease, uh, your risk of getting complications from COVID is higher. Uh, so uh, although ITP in itself is not a, a cardiovascular disease, uh, it's not unusual that sometimes these patients that have these type of uh, immune reactions could have some degree of inflammation in the blood vessels in the, in the body, and that combined with the COVID could make for a perfect storm. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a clear cut cap black and white uh, answer because we don't know. Uh, uh, fortunately, ITP is one of those things that, you know, it's not like uh, hypertension that, you know, everyone knows two or three people that have high blood pressure. Uh, ITP, you know, you can go your entire life and never heard of the condition. So it's something that I would say be cautious, uh, uh, don't let your guard down, and if you need to take certain precautions for at least yourself to feel safe in, in whatever situation you're putting yourself into, I would say go ahead. But more In, in this case, uh, be more uh, uh, on the safe side, it's better than doing less. Thanks. That was... Um... Maybe if for questions, there's some comments of someone sharing their concern with virtual learning with younger children. I don't know if anyone would want to comment on that. Well, I think the younger children do need more social interaction to do those developmental social emotional learning that they need to do. They need to see other people's reactions, their faces, to learn those cues that um, may not come across as well on a uh, video screen. And in some ways, again, going back to this balance and equity question, it, uh, there have been a number of studies that show that kids under 10 are much less likely to spread COVID to adults in their households. And so there may be a group of kids that have a high need to be in person to do all those social emotional learning that can do that without a grave risk to the adults at home. Now, each individual family, again, like I said, is different because somebody at home on chemo, it doesn't, there's no risk that's in, you know, that's low enough. But uh I I agree. I think that that the younger kids need more social interaction than you can get on a video screen. So the, if you look at the the guidance from the Department of Education here in Massachusetts, uh, they do give the option for this hybrid uh, programs that some of it can be virtual at home and some of it can be in person. Uh, obviously, they're using the rate of infectivity within each town to make those decisions. And like Dr. O'Reilly was mentioning at the beginning, it's something that changes week by week, because if you look at the example from three or four weeks ago, if I'm remembering correctly, Holyoke and Granby were what we would call in the red, that the numbers were, uh, uh, were kind of high. But the very next week, they dropped down to yellow, and Holyoke is almost down to the green. So if you're in the red, you're supposed to have no in-person uh, uh, classes. But if you're in the yellow, you can do like a hybrid program that kids can go to school uh, for a few days and then do virtual learning for a few others. So it's something that uh, cities are looking at as we move forward. And obviously they need to keep an eye on these uh, reports from the DPH that will guide whether, oh, we can still do the hybrid versus do we need to go full virtual. Uh, I understand that some kids, especially the younger ones, do need that social interaction to develop a, a whole bunch of skills. And these kind of hybrids will probably help in certain in a certain amount to surmount that. Uh, whether that can be done throughout the entire uh, fall uh, academic uh, 
period, or if it's going to be like an on and off because, you know, the cases went up, they went down, uh, it'll have to be a conversation. At least I can tell you that for at least our state and our surrounding states, the infectivity rates have remained relatively low. Uh, if you look at Massachusetts, uh, let's just talk for basic. If you look at all the, te the testing that we're doing right here at basic, our positivity rate is less than 2%. So that's very good numbers, uh, almost comparable to what we're getting from New York, that they're around uh, 1%, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so we're doing really good, but again, not the entire nation is not doing as well. And uh, we are getting some travel uh, from state to state, and uh, that's what we need to keep our vigilance up. Thanks. We do have a couple more questions. Uh, one being, what questions would you ask teachers, schools, and universities if your own children were going that would make you feel better as a healthcare provider? Um, I, I guess what I, I would say, I, I, I referenced there some of the information from the Harvard School of Public Health um and how to make our you know the return safe return to school and the 20 questions i think there there basically are a slew of questions between you know when their child gets if they go on a bus to when they get to school when they go through their classes and till they get home i think the simple ones are straightforward do they mandate masks do they have can washing stations or sanitizing stations, and do they use them frequently? Are they practicing social distancing? Then there's questions about cohorting. Are we keeping the same group of, of students and teachers together? So if there is somebody within that small group is positive, that you're not spreading it through the whole school. Are they doing things, um, the fancy term now in this is de-densifying, that they're not bringing every student through the front door at the same time, that class bell doesn't ring and 5,000 students jam into a hallway, that they are adjusting how they move students through the school so that the, the risk of contact and the risk of spread is lessened. Even, again, granting everyone has a mask, Granting everyone has is hand washing. We still have to worry about tons of kids roughhousing in the middle. The next big area that you have to think about is ventilation. And I know the ID per people are, will, will get back at me on this, but the idea is we've really shifted a little bit between the idea of droplet infections, that it's this heavy thing that goes and drops in three to six feet, versus the issue now about things that are aerosolized. And the, the nuance is that that's a difficult conversation and we shouldn't get into all the medicine of it, but schools should do as best they can to improve ventilation so that the risk of aerosolized spread is low. So if they're a centralized uh, system, they should be doing a MERV 13 or, or better filtering system. If they, they don't, they, and they have windows, they should be figuring out how they're opening the windows and using simple fans. And if they don't have, if the windows need to be closed or if they don't have windows, how we use room purifiers to a degree that will help. All of that information, I think, for parents is in that uh, Harvard School for Public Health information. And I would use it as a primer to go and talk to the schools. So I'll defer to my other panelists. One thing that might be helpful is that you could ask the school for what their plan is. Uh, I serve as a commissioner for the Board of Health in Holyoke, and the schools in Holyoke have to submit a plan to the Board of Health to verify everything that they're doing and make sure that you know they're following all the state guidelines and that the kids are safe as they go in. Uh, a lot of these plans that the schools make answer uh, many of the questions that Dr. O'Reilly and that uh, the Harvard uh, 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 paper mentions. So it's a very good source just to kind of read through it and 
get some answers. Some uh, times the writing may be a little bit confusing because they're saying the same thing more than once and the way they're writing certain things, if you're not a public health expert, might sound weird or you might not understand that. So uh, those are the things that perhaps you need to communicate with the school and say, well, you know, I want to make sure that uh, we, everyone is required to wear a mask and including the teachers and the custodians. Is that happening? Uh, are we checking temperatures when the kids come in? Uh, are they coming in through this door and oh, the only way to leave the school is from this other door? That way you're not having crisscrossing of kids. Uh, are you staggering the lunch period so not, you don't have, like Dr. Riley said, 5,000 kids coming into lunch at the same time? Uh, some of the plans that the school submits to the local boards of health uh, will have that information. Uh, sometimes the plans that are submitted are very general. Uh, and some schools have very good plans. Some other schools need a little help. And sometimes having parents raise those questions uh, <coughs> might be the trigger that the school needs to say, oh, you know, we were following all the little dots that the DPH gave us, but we didn't think of that. And, you know, we have this particular group of students that, you know, some of them might be on chemo, some of them uh, uh, might have other medical conditions that require uh, closer contact from the teacher and the student. And just raising those questions might be enough to say, oh, you know, we didn't think about that, we need to address it. So uh, I would probably suggest that you kind of look into if the school already has a plan, uh, because that might answer a lot of the questions. Hi, it's Elizabeth again. I think also it's important. What if a kid develops a fever? Because somebody will. At school, does the school have a plan? And most of them do to, you know, get the child out of the classroom, keep them away from others. Colleges and universities have pretty extensive ones because sometimes that kid is hours away from their home and has to be quarantined. But our local schools, most of them also have that, but you would just want to for a lot of parents, that's where a lot of the panic comes in, right? A kid <clears throat> in the class had fever, then what happens? Okay, we had another question um, asking if there was any advice on how to protect the rest of the family if, if the, my child uh, would test positive. I'll let the adults start. I'll add, <laughs> I'll add to it, but I'll let you guys start. They, those are grown up questions. You're on mute. Okay. So it's very tricky and I guess it depends on uh, what exactly we're talking about and exposure. Because there's one thing if you say, well, my child is in a class and one of the classmates that's a positive and this kid is coming home and in home mom or dad are on active treatment for chemo or are on Remicade because they have also colitis or whatever. Uh, that's one conversation because obviously there are two degrees of separation between the actual patient and the family. Uh, obviously, the way that you would approach that is that you, you still need to make sure that the child is almost isolated, quarantined from the rest of the family. So that might require that even when you're home with the child, you're wearing masks and the kids are wearing masks and they only can be without masks when they're in their room alone. Uh, obviously, if you look at some of our uh, uh, populations of patients, you know, we have patients of uh, uh, low income that might have uh, a kid with two or three other uh, uh, persons in the room. So that can get tricky real quick. Uh, if you look at some of the World Health Organization uh, uh, suggestions, they uh, give you these guidance to have uh, these uh, almost uh, curtains made with uh, 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 shower curtains or even uh, uh, cheats to kind of create like a mini room within the room and kind of try to keep the, the exposed person as, as isolated as we can. Uh, the person can be tested, but again, if the exposure just happened, that initial test uh, will probably be negative and doesn't really translate that, oh, that person is safe. Uh, if you look at what the DPH is recommending, that person needs to be isolated for the full uh, 14 days. And after that 14 days, if there are no development of symptoms and the person is otherwise doing well, uh, at least what we're doing here in BASE, we do suggest that the person get 
uh, tested at the end of those 14 days, uh, just to make sure that you're not asymptomatic and positive and then spreading it around. Uh, the other situation that could occur is that your kid goes to school, it's been a few days, and now they have a fever, they get tested, and they're positive. So that's a little bit different because there's already been an exposure at home uh, because obviously the kid uh, has been incubating for a few days before they actually develop symptoms and uh, te get tested positive. In those cases, uh, it's suggested that the entire family is tested. And obviously the entire family almost needs to go into quarantine. Uh, the DPH follows with the family to make sure that everyone gets tested. Some of the local boards board of health will actually get involved and coordinate testing for the family if need be. Uh, so those are the two big situations. Uh, if it's uh, 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 two degrees of separation that there was a kid in class that got infected and your child was within the class, I always tell people you need to look at what the exact risk is because it's not the same as if it was the kid that was across the room you were wearing masks and your only interaction was that you were sitting in the same uh, room for a few hours versus, oh, this is my best friend that I went and played basketball with on our free period or something like that. Very different uh, uh, risk factors. And obviously that would require that if this is identified, uh, we need to sit down with the people and anyone involved and say, well, were you wearing your mask? Were you cleaning your hands? What was the actual interaction that occurred between the patient that was identified as positive and everyone around them uh, and based on that is how anxious or no do we need to get uh, in translating the information and things that have happened inside hospitals to the outside uh, we've uh, had uh, uh, patients that have been positive for COVID unknowingly and transferred to certain uh, floors in the hospital and since the staff has all been wearing their masks, uh, watching their hands, keeping their distance, there was no transmission uh, from there out. Uh, it's when you start dropping your guard that, oh, I'm not going to wear my mask all the time. Or, uh, you know, I wash my hands when I went in the room. I don't have to wash my hands when I walk out of the room. Or, you know, we know each other. You look fine. I look fine. We can just sit down and all uh, uh, take from the same ball of penis and just shove it in our face. <laughs> so in those situations, that's when you see the transmission. And that's basically what happened in the camp down in Georgia, in the school down in Georgia, and a few other colleges down south that, you know, people let their guard down because everyone looks fine and the transmission happens. It's been shown time and time again that if you're wearing your mask and you're cleaning your hands, that your chances of actually acquiring the virus are exceedingly low. Thanks. There was um, another question that had been touched on by John a bit. It was regarding air circulation and heating systems for indoor schools in the winter. Is there anything left to be said about how we know the buildings uh, will be safe during COVID? Well, uh, what I would say, and, I, and again, I think we're, we have somebody who was on the school board and the committee. I think the same same things and I know that uh, Molly Sen McNally, who's one of our docs, who was the school doc for Springfield, they're actively looking at each school and each classroom to say, can we make this individual classroom or this building safe? And I think schools are really doing the due diligence uh, about that. And uh, it's, there is some complicated engineering and HVAC kind of stuff involved. But from what I know in Springfield, they're really working on it. And again, you can look at the Harvard study for some of the details of that. And uh, but I think the schools know and are working on it. I, I, I'll defer to you guys. I, I agree, John. Most of the schools and most of the teachers' unions are really yeah. on top of uh, saying we need all of the the circulation and the building systems looked at. And there is some guidance from the CDC and others around what, how many times an hour should air be circulated, <clears throat> that sort of thing. But Esteban's our expert. 
<laughs> yeah. no, no pressure, man. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the schools need to look at the infrastructure. And, you know, uh, you can't really compare a school that was built in the past 10 years versus a school that has been there for the past 100 years. Uh, the ventilation systems are quite different. Uh, force airs versus boilers are quite different. Uh, and obviously, circulation is going to differ depending on the building structure, material, and AC heating system that the school has. Uh, in uh, Disney World, where all my dreams come true, you can just open up all the windows, open all of the doors, and let the air flow through the entire building. If you look at uh, some of the infection control practices that we do in uh, the deep jungles in South America or in, even in Africa for tuberculosis, which is uh, uh, airborne uh, uh, transmission. And this is one of the things they do. They basically sit the doctor here, sit the patient here, make sure that the window and the door is open and that the airflow is going <laughs> one way. Uh, and it works relatively well. Uh, so you would expect that something that seems to be mostly droplet, uh, if you take those things into account, that would work quite well. That's why uh, if you see the things that we've done at BASIC, we made sure that, you know, there's outdoor seating and we put these big uh, tents outside. So when people have breaks, they can just go outside and not be in enclosed small spaces uh, within the building. Uh, the ability of the school to get that information will vary depending on the city and how uh, much information they have regarding the, the building itself. Uh, what they can do about it will depend a lot on a lot of times on the resources that the school and the city can provide. Uh, because you know, if your school has all the money to spend in the world, you know, it's easy enough uh, to put in a, a air circulation system that has uh, HIPAA filters and maybe even UV light because money is not an issue. But if you go to a school that has trouble even getting books to the students, that might not be an option. So, again, it'll depend greatly on the individual circumstances of each school. And just knowing the information and just asking the information uh, will be important. And, and just another of the many ways that COVID-19 has shown us how inequity is just throughout our healthcare system, our education system, our whole social scene, that those people that are poor, those people of color, are suffering on so many levels uh, out of proportion for, because of this illness. Yeah. If, if you look at the cases that we've had, let's say for July, uh, I think we diagnosed our almost 200 people, and well over 60% of those were people of color. Uh, so that just goes to show you that this proportionate way that uh, the pandemic is hitting our communities, and uh, I agree with some of the sentiments that even Dr. Fauci has already expressed that, you know, the pandemic didn't create the uh, uh, inequality, it's just highlighting it. Okay, there, there is a few minutes left, and there is one more question if we can tackle it. Since Bay State says that we can work as long as we are asymptomatic, even if our child catches COVID, how are we going to keep staff from bringing COVID into the hospital once schools open? Oh, I'm definitely deferring that to our ID expert and the gro and one of our vice presidents for a service line. <laughs> it has nothing to do with little babies. I'm deferring. <laughs> I'll give you guys the easy one to answer in three minutes. <laughs> so oh, excellent. So I, I think you're the expert, but in public <laughs> health, I, I'm just going to say as a public service announcement is, you know, doing a great job and you can call them with any questions. Yeah. It's going to depend on the specifics, right? Yeah. So, uh, it'll depend on uh, exactly that these, the specifics, uh, because if there was a high suspicion of an exposure, uh, employee health has an algorithm that has been checked by uh, the ID attendings, by employee health, uh, by our hospital epidemiologist, Dr. Sarah Hasler, it has been checked by our uh, uh, chief of uh, infection control, uh, Mary uh, Ellen Scales. So it's what we've been using and it's been working out really, really well. Uh, the employee health service line uh, is there and the nurses are very attuned to everything that's going on because they've been dealing with this for a few months now. So 
if you ever had any doubt of, uh, you know, I my kid got infected at school, uh, I'm okay, uh, how do I proceed from here? Uh, call employee health because depending on certain circumstances that are around of the actual exposure, it's what we might tell you to do. That might range from uh, a symptom screen that you have to do every day and report to your supervisor, uh, to testing, to even being out of work. Uh, so it'll all depend on uh, specific circumstances that employee health will ask about. Uh, if you ever have any doubts or any questions regarding that, the hotline for uh, the COVID hotline that's in the hub, that is a very good resource. There's always a nurse there, and they have direct access to the infectious disease attendings and the infection control uh, section. So if they don't know the answer right away, they'll get someone that knows. <laughs> Uh, so I would just suggest that if that situation were to occur, instead of just coming into work, uh, just call employee health and have them guide you through the process. Because it might be that they tell you, yeah, just come in and we're going to test you in the MOB or go have you sent to one of the offsite testing uh, facilities. Or they might say, you, you know, with the information that we have, that's not a very high risk exposure. We're going to do the symptom screen and we're going to have you come in. There's an entire algorithm and a table that we use to kind of look at those. And I don't think that three minutes that we still have is enough time to discuss <laughs> the entire thing. <laughs> so, yeah, call employee health and they'll guide you through the entire process. Good answer. <laughs> Any final comments uh, before we wrap up this event? I just want to thank John and Esteban because you did you were great. Thank you for <laughs> coming in, pinch hitting, all, all of the above, the the you know, the women in uh uh the women empowered, the women's resource group, and all of Bay State Health thanks you for, for coming. Crystal would have been much smarter and more articulate, but I try my best. <laughs> You're awesome. We appreciate it. Yeah. Happy to be here. I know that, uh, you know, as things move in, uh, like John was mentioning, things change week by week, day by day, sometimes even things hour by hour. So, you know, uh, we're available. If you have questions, I don't have, I don't mind getting emails. I get emails every other day asking me questions about this. So I, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, uh, I might not know all the answers, but I know very smart people that might. So we try to we we try our very best. You were all amazing, and I also want to thank Do thank Dr. Elizabeth Boyle, a pediatrician and vice president of primary care and clinical integrate <laughs> I can't talk today integration at Bay State Health. Thank you all. It was brilliant, and we appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us today. Have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you again.